before the motorcade. Before the sixth floor sniper's nest. Before Dallas. There was Minsk. For more than two years at the start of the 1960s, the capital of the Soviet Republic of Belarus was home to Lee Harvey Oswald, a self-declared Marxist following his defection to the Soviet Union. The man later accused of assassinating President John F. Kennedy tried to renounce his American citizenship and was sent from Moscow by Soviet authorities to work at a Minsk radio factory. During his stay in Minsk, Soviet security services kept a close watch on Oswald, on his movements around the city, and those who surrounded him. More than 50 years later, there are those who knew Oswald in Minsk and have never spoken on camera about their experience with him. Stanislaw Shushkevich was the first post-Soviet leader of Belarus. Long before entering politics, Shushkevich worked at the same factory with the American defector. He and another man became Oswald's Russian teachers. He was a rather closed person, and it was hard to tell how educated he was. But his knowledge of Russian was pretty decent, and he could exchange views when Sasha Rubenchik and I started teaching him, that's for sure. A lengthy and highly detailed account of observations about Soviet living and working conditions, called The Collective, was attributed to Oswald during the investigation into Kennedy's death. Shushkevich scoffs at the thought of Oswald authoring such a report. You know, if I had been asked to take him into my research team, I would have refused immediately, even though I would have been curious to work with an American. I didn't see any inclination of inquiry or creativity in him. Maybe I'm being unjust, but he showed absolutely no interest in the things that seemed important to me. Oswald was not only receiving language education, there was also music. His new friends took him to hear classical music at the Minsk Philharmonic Concert Hall. Ina Markova met Oswald for the first time at a performance of Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto in E minor. She later visited Oswald at his small apartment, which was located in an exclusive section of Minsk. Markova returned to the apartment to share her impressions of him. I can't say he was easy to communicate with. He didn't evoke any feelings that would leave an impression. Sometimes you meet someone and think, goodness, what a pleasure. I don't remember having that feeling with him. Markova says she thought Oswald was rather ordinary, unathletic, generally reserved, and even boring most of the time. But she recalls seeing flashes of something else. Once I saw anger in him. Someone said something he didn't like, and he became so angry that his face even contorted. He probably tried to conceal his emotions, but they jumped out. He controlled them to some degree, but every now and then they jumped out. At the Institute of Foreign Languages near his apartment, Oswald was known for his keen interest in the female students, regularly socializing at the dormitories there. He later wrote of his successes with women, but Markova says not all were impressed. The girls and I often wondered why he had left America. He could have studied there, worked there, but he cut all his ties. Everybody thought he was odd, like he had crossed some line. Markova says Oswald taught language students to dance the twist, and he sometimes went dancing at the Palace of Culture of Trade Unions. It was at one of these events that he met Marina Prusakova. Just six weeks later, in the spring of 1961, Oswald married Marina. Within a year, his wife gave birth to their daughter, June. 
Documents written by Oswald and discovered after the assassination give the impression that he had contradictory views regarding the United States and the Soviet Union, sometimes praising the countries, at other times condemning them. The Presidential Commission, led by U.S. Chief Justice Earl Warren, concluded Oswald acted alone in killing the president. Lee Harvey Oswald appeared to be a different man, in different places, with different people. He showed the world many faces. But the face the world saw in Dallas will be forever associated with the death of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. <laughs>